Aloha. Aloha. I wouldn't be surprised if it would be conservative to say that students rarely understand the principles of the infinite way during the first five years of their study. As a matter of fact, I have often felt that when students come and say they would like to know about the infinite way, that I ought to ask them if they've got seven years to study to learn the basic principles. I'm sure there wouldn't be many remain. But if you watch our work, you will notice that very few students get very close to me in the way of any special teaching until they have been students for five or six years. And the reason is that I can't expect anyone to grasp anything that is as radical as this teaching without at least five years of study. As a matter of fact, I'd find myself in a very strange position if that weren't true, because I very frankly didn't grasp it for lots more than 10 years, even though I was doing healing work, becoming recognized nationwide. I still didn't fully grasp the principles of the infinite way. And I suppose I could go a step further and say I'm commencing now to understand them better than ever. And that's after 27 or 28 years. There's a reason for it. At first reading, the student is apt to say, why, this is true. This is what I've always believed. And... The reason for that is that they read words like God, Christ, Spirit, Soul, Prayer, Christ Consciousness, God Consciousness, and they're familiar with those words, and of course they think that I mean what they have been believing, and I don't. There is a far different meaning to the word God than anything that is used in uh, church teachings. We have a far different understanding of the word prayer. Even meditation. We speak so much and write so much about meditation that there are students who really believe that meditation is the goal of this work, that when you can meditate, you've really gotten somewhere. That isn't true at all. Meditation is just one of the uh, avenues, one of our little tools, one of the little instruments that we use to get somewhere. In and of itself, meditation is nothing. Meditation is an instrument through which we arrive somewhere. But meditation isn't the place we're going. The place we're going is conscious union with God. That's our goal. That's the attainment. And meditation is just one of the ways that we use. And even when we say meditation, we don't always mean the same thing. Because in the infinite way, meditation has many meanings. There is a meditation that we call contemplative meditation in which we take scriptural passages into our meditation and ponder them, think about them, dwell on them, ask God questions about them, 
try to receive uh, inner, deeper meanings of them than we have heretofore known or understood. There's another contemplation which is a communion. It is, uh, it takes place after we have arrived at a place where we feel the presence of God in us. Of course, you might ask the question, what do you mean by feel the presence of God? And I would have to say, I can't answer that. Everyone knows when they feel the presence of God. It doesn't fool them. It doesn't deceive them. And if you're in doubt as to whether or not you have felt the presence of God, you may rightly assume that you haven't. Because when you do, it is so positive, and there are such definite signs following, that there can be no question in your own mind. The rest of the world may question you, the rest of the world may want to imprison you or institutionalize you for your convictions, but you yourself will know this was it. There's another form or phase or facet of meditation which comes sometime during this communion with the Father within when all of a sudden there is no Father to commune with and probably there is no you to do any communing there is just such a complete oneness that you couldn't tell yourself where God leaves off and you begin. I and the Father are one. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. And uh, you come into an actual inner awareness when that actually takes place. And you're not sure whether you're a man or God. But actually, when you come back to yourself, you realize that you had lost yourself in God. The word prayer, it doesn't make any difference what your background has been. You do not mean the same thing when you say prayer that we mean for this reason. All prayer, as it is usually understood, is a means of getting something from God. It may be health, it may be opportunity, it may be protection, it may be companionship, it may be joy, but prayer in its usual sense is a turning to God for something. Now prayer in its lowest form is a petition asking God for something, asking God for health, or asking God for supply, or asking God for protection. That is virtually a paganistic form of prayer. It was the original form of prayer of the ancient pagans when uh, they didn't have enough rain for their crops and they decided that there must be a supernatural being who controlled those things, and so they prayed to that supernatural being, oh, give us rain for our crops. Or if it was too much rain, they probably prayed, uh, stop the rain. And if it were fishing season and there weren't enough fish, they prayed to God to give them better crops of fish, a larger catch. If somebody in the family was sick, they went so far as to pray God to make this person well. Now that's the prayers of the old pagans. And it was adopted into the church, and it is in use today in most churches. They still do not think that there is anything strange about telling the all-knowing God what things we need. They still do not think it's strange 
to ask God for something that they think is missing in their lives, and God can give it to them, but God isn't doing it. For some strange reason, people cannot accept the idea that God is an infinite wisdom that created this whole universe, including man, and certainly must have enough wisdom to know what man needs without being told. In spite of the fact that the Master taught, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, wherewithal you shall be clothed. Your Heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things. It doesn't stop them praying for supply or health or safety or security or whatever it is they think they need or want. Now, that petitionary form of prayer has been taught to the ordinary layman in the churches right up to and including the present day. But those a little further along in spiritual understanding know better than that. And even though they may not teach it to their church members, they themselves know that there's a higher form of prayer than that of petition. Then there are those who are usually called mystics or saints or seers or sages Buddhas, enlightened people who have gone still further and know the absolute truth about prayer. But usually by that time they realize that the ordinary man or woman isn't prepared to give up their concept of God as a superhuman or to give up their concept of prayer as a way of wangling something out of God. And so they develop the habit of silence, sometimes retiring from the world into the mountains or caves or seasides or somewhere off alone, and uh, not revealing to others what they have learned. And now there are others who have become the mystic poets of the world who have written very honestly, openly, and frankly about the subject of true prayer. But you'll find very few copies of those books in circulation outside of universities or public libraries where only the very deep students ever find them. Now, of course, <clears throat> it was undoubtedly back in the days of Mrs. Eddy when the first public teaching was given on the subject of a different form of prayer than the petitionary, and that prayer was the affirmative. You didn't ask God for anything you affirmed God's presence, God's power, God's jurisdiction over his own creation. You denied a power to evil. You denied that anything could have power unless it came from God. And you affirmed and reaffirmed the truths that you studied and knew about God. And that, of course, has become what is now known as metaphysical treatment. Metaphysical treatment is the affirmation of the presence and power, all wisdom, all might, all love, all life of God, and the denial of a presence or power apart from God. I'm sketching this very briefly. It goes, it has wide ramifications, but the essence of it is that when you stop petitioning God, when you stop asking God, you come to a place where you acknowledge God. 
You affirm the infinite nature of God. You affirm the infinite all-knowingness of God. You affirm God as love, that which knoweth thy need and uh, whose good pleasure it is to give it to you. And so it is that you learn, oh, there are a thousand things to know and learn in this prayer of affirmation and denial, which really constitutes a metaphysical treatment. That, too, is a step on the way toward higher forms of prayer. But that form in itself is an important one because it breaks the old habits of thought. It breaks, shall we call it, the subconscious ideas that you have of God that you've carried over from old teachings. It helps you to get away from this idea of looking to God as some kind of a superhuman and of looking to it for favors. You see, when you replace petition with affirmation and denial, you are coming to that place in your own consciousness where you are saying, It isn't only ridiculous, it's presumptuous to tell God what things I have need of when God created me in the beginning. God made me in his own image and likeness. And if the all-knowing God doesn't know what I have need of, and if the all-knowing God doesn't give me what I have need of without my begging and beseeching, I have very little confidence and belief that I can move God. Think of that. Think of that, of trying to influence God to do something that God is not already doing. Now, in just what I have said to you, you can see that when we say God, we do not mean anything that you have heretofore learned, a God that is withholding something and can be giving it. And so you learn that when we say God, we're referring to something that is not withholding anything that is rightfully ours, nor can God give it. And the reason is, whatever it is, God is already manifesting it. And just imagine if you were to look to the sun and ask it for light or for warmth. You don't do that. Even now, when there is no sun available, you are not going to sit up tonight and ask God to be sure that there is warmth in the sun tomorrow or that there is light in the sun. Why? Because you know that the nature of the sun is warmth and light. So what you're going to do is wait patiently for morning to come and behold the sun arise with warmth and light already shining. You don't try to tell God what time you would like the tides to come in or to go out. Even if you're a fisherman, you wouldn't think of doing that. You would find out when, in the natural order of things, the tides are coming in and going out, and you would base your fishing trips on that which is, but you would certainly not try to influence God to change the tides for your sake. So it is. In our work, it isn't enough to say, I believe in God or have faith in God, unless you actually know the letter of truth as it is given in our writings, you never will understand God from the standpoint that we are presenting God. And we are presenting a God that does not have to be petitioned, a God that does not have to be influenced, as a matter of fact, a God that can't be influenced. We are presenting a God 
of infinite intelligence, infinite divine love, and all power. The moment you begin to contemplate that kind of a God, the moment you sit quietly and begin to think, what is the nature of this God that I believe in, that I have faith in? What is it that I believe in? What is it that I have faith in? And if you have read these books rightly, you will answer yourself. I know above all things that God is infinite, eternal, immortal. I know that God is where I am. I know that God is love, that which maintains and sustains its own creation. I know that God is the all-eternal power of this universe and uh, none of these things that claim power, sin, disease, death, lack, limitation, none of these are power in the presence of God. I know from this that I have learned that I need not fear what mortal man can do to me. I need not fear what the elements can do to me or the time. I need not fear what wars or depressions can do to me. Why? Because I have the understanding of a God that is closer to me than breathing, nearer than hands and feet, a God that created me in its own image and likeness, a God that has the wisdom and the power and the love to maintain me and to sustain, sustain me throughout eternity. I know now why the psalmist could say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fear. That's the end of it. I shall not fear. Not asking God for anything. Not expecting anything of God. Just announcing, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not fear. And you remember later, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Not I beg and beseech, he leadeth me. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Yes, and we have all been just obstinate enough to make him make us lie down in green pastures. Or later the psalmist says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. There is the God that is presented to us in the infinite way, but without the study of the writings, you are just going to see the word God there and say, well, I always believed it. But you didn't, because you were not thinking of God in this particular light. Now, when I say to you that when you were contemplating that nature of God and coming to the conclusion within yourself that you don't have to pray to God for anything. You only have to keep your mind stayed on God. Pray without ceasing or acknowledge him in all thy ways. Always keep in thought the remembrance of the presence of God, the very place where I stand is holy ground, because God is there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. That is prayer according to the infinite way. The contemplation within yourself of the nature of God is prayer. You haven't thought of yourself, you haven't asked for yourself, you haven't desired anything for yourself. All you have done is contemplate the presence and the power of God, the nature of God as love. The fact that we are the image and likeness of God, that we live and move and have our being in God consciousness, this is prayer. To some extent, it is an affirmative state of prayer, but I think of it mostly as a contemplative form of prayer or contemplative form of meditation. It is in the same way that I recommend to our students the carrying with them, wherever possible, of the Red Letter Bible, the words of Jesus in the uh, red letter, it's a small volume, and without any attempt to memorize anything in it, 
just reading some of those red letter passages a few today a few tomorrow next week two three four five months pass by and you find that they're already implanted in your own consciousness then you come to a place in your experience and uh, let us say you awaken in the morning with the realization you've got a hard day ahead of you business obligations or family duties or community activities but whatever it is it's a hard day and you don't believe you're up to it you face the day with misgivings with doubts which is good which is very good it shows forth humility it is just like the master saying I can in my own self do nothing and then in that moment you all of a sudden remember some of these passages of scripture that you have been reading either in the Bible or in our writings and you remember he that is within me is greater than he that is in the world and you sit down for a moment you contemplate that but what have I to fear there is something within me we call it God the presence of God the Christ but there is something within me at least according to the teaching of the great Hebrew and Christian masters there is something within me greater than anything that's in the world greater than any problem well then I have nothing to fear because now it is not up to me to perform the functions of this day but to let the presence of God work in me and through me and by that time you feel a weight dropping off of your shoulder and be surprised or not you have prayed or you have contemplated or you have meditated actually what you've done is you have taken a scriptural promise into your consciousness you have thought about it until you came to the place where you had complete assurance that it was truth and then you went on about your business another day difficult situations present themselves and you remember he performeth that which is given me to do he perfecteth that which concerneth me and then you sit back for a few minutes you relax he 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 well yes the master said I can of my own self do nothing the father within me he doeth the works oh that's the he that performeth that which is given me to do he perfecteth that which concerneth me he the father within me well if you've read the infinite way writings very long you have read a hundred times closer to me than breathing nearer than hands and feet and so you remember he that is within me he that is closer to me than breathing this is the only place in the world that's closer to me than breathing right here where the breathing takes place and right here within me is the kingdom of God what have I to fear oh and there again you have prayed you have contemplated you have kept your mind on God you have prayed without ceasing you have acknowledged God in all your ways and so you find that without turning to God with any specific request without any specific desire you have risen to a higher state of understanding of God you have a higher concept of God than you ever had before and you have a higher concept of prayer for now you know that all your ways are in God's keeping and you do not have to ask him or influence him or direct him ah but what about this if you haven't read these books and aren't reading them faithfully steadily regularly and you haven't this letter of truth within you this knowledge of truth as it has come down to us through all the ages through all the great saints and seers for always remember that I did not make up this teaching it is not a an invention of mine 
nor is it a creation of mine. I'm merely presenting to you the wisdoms of the ages that have come down to us through the greatest known saints, seers, and sages that ever was, and I'm presenting it to you because my own individual life experience has proved the rightness of it. I'm not trying to proselyte or sell it to you. I'm merely telling you about it because you came here. If you hadn't come here, I wouldn't have sent for you. But you are here, and so I'm sharing my life's experience with you, but not presenting any new religion, not presenting to you anything that hasn't been known by every spiritual saint and seer as far back as 4000 B.C. Now, for you remember that even the Master Christ Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. I have not come to destroy the saints or the prophets or their law, but to fulfill them. In other words, this thing that the Master taught was ages old before he was ever on earth. You must remember that the two great commandments that he gave the world when he virtually did away with the ten and substituted two were both given to the world a thousand years before he was on earth. The first one is in Exodus, which was the first commandment given by Moses. And that became the first commandment that Jesus Christ gave. And the second is in the book of Leviticus, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And in my book, Spiritual Interpretation of Scripture, I have given the golden rule, as it is written as far back as 4000 B.C. Jesus did not present a new religion. He presented the wisdom of the old religion, but not the religious teachings of the people, but the religious teachings of the saints and the seers. The only difference is this, that Christ Jesus added something to the world of religion that so far as written uh, documents are concerned, never before was known. He added that which was never before known and which has become the cornerstone of the infinite way. What he added was, get above the law until you are living by grace, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Resist not evil. He took us out of the Judaic teachings of fulfilling a law to the place of living by grace where we were taught not to sue the man who owed us anything and if he sued us, let him have it. He took us to the place of not resisting the man who slandered us or fought us or persecuted us but are forgiving him and praying for him. That was an entirely new teaching given to the world. It is where we rise above the law to the place of where we live by grace. Now, as you follow the teachings of the infinite way, you will find that over and over and over again, we try to bring out that in our work of prayer or treatment, our healing work, that we are never fighting error any more than that we're asking God for any favors. We are neither turning to God and asking for anything or expecting anything, nor are we fighting error. The place where you will ultimately arrive if you rightly understand the message of the infinite way is this you will come to a place where you will have an inner conviction that God is. And you can well trust God to run his own universe. And then, with that in mind, you will be able to look at any phase of error and say, Thou couldst have no power over me. Now, Jesus demonstrated this 
In one instance, he healed a blind man by putting spittle on his eye. Now, in the Hebrew faith, spittle meant nothing. If you wanted to show your disrespect of a person, you spat at them. That's about as low down an opinion as you could have of anyone, was to spit at them. And he took spit and put it on blindness to prove how little respect he had for blindness, how little faith he had that it had any power. And by knowing its non-power to that extent, the man was healed. He went up to a leper and put his hand on him. What more can you do that would prove that you have no faith in the power of leprosy? What more can you do than to go up and put your own hand on it? By that he was saying, leprosy, try to do something. You can't. You have no power. God didn't give you power. And if God didn't, what did? And so he himself demonstrated, resist not evil. Don't give it power. Don't battle it. Realize within yourself that this thing that you've been battling and fighting and hoping God would do something about didn't need a God and didn't need your battling because it was already nothingness awaiting your recognition of it. Yes, but how are you going to attain that consciousness if you do not study those writings sufficiently to become aware of those principles so that when you are faced with error in any form, that instead of immediately setting up a battle within yourself against it, you can smile at it. I have been told by many students that I made a mistake in my writings by saying that someday you will heal disease with a smile. Because our students are all trying to heal it with a smile before they take all the steps leading up to that. Well, I suppose that's like saying 12 times 12 or 144, but it's a mistake to say it because the children will try to demonstrate it before they learn the multiplication table. But the truth is that we will ultimately heal merely with a smile. When will that be? When we are sufficiently aware of the fact that God has not given his glory to another. God has not given his glory to disease. God has not given his power to disease. God has not given his power to sin. God has not given his power to lack and limitation. Therefore, what power have they got if they haven't got God power? There can't be a devil. That was good enough for ancient religion, but certainly nobody today believes that there's a devil. Ah, but they will say, no, I don't believe there's a personal devil with a uh, pitchfork and uh, cloven hoofs and a tail, but then there's impersonal error. That's being nonsensical. That's acknowledging the same thing as a devil, only giving it a different name. A rose by any other name would be just as sweet. And if there's a devil, by any name he would be just as powerful, or it would. But we haven't merely proven in religion that, that there is no devil and no physical hell. But by proving that, we have proved that there is no power of evil. It doesn't mean that it hasn't got a lot of power in this world as long as there are those to give it power. But this power shall not come nigh thy dwelling place. A thousand may fall at your left and ten thousand at your right. It will not come nigh you if you know this truth. If you are dwelling in this truth of the first commandment, I shall have no other gods, no, acknowledge no other power but one and then be willing to spit at any form of error, figuratively anyhow, then you will come to see that error has only as much power as you give it. One of the great proofs of that is the tremendous amount of illness there is in the world through infectious and contagious diseases, and how little of it ever strikes the metaphysician. Why? 
because the germs are null and void in the presence of a person who knows that God never gave them any power to do anything or be anything. And they find that they have no such power. That's prayer. The very ability to realize infection, contagion. What, what made you a power? Who gave you a power? God? Did God give a power to something to strike down its own image and likeness? I don't think so. Well, then where did you get your power? Is there more than one source? If there is, then the first commandments are all wrong. And Moses was wrong and Jesus was wrong. But if those great leaders were right, saints, seers, sages they were, saviors, if they were right, and God is the only power, who gave power to disease? Who gave power to sin? Nobody. Then isn't it our fault that we have come through ignorance, superstition, we have come to place power in disease. And then the power we gave it struck out at us. Ah, yes. But because this is true doesn't mean that you can demonstrate it. You can demonstrate it only in proportion as you come to an inner conviction of it. And before you can do that, you first have to know these things, and then you have to practice them. When uh, you begin to know, I'm going to accept a God of infinite good, of infinite power, immortal life. I'm going to accept in my life a God that's closer to me than breathing. I'm going to accept a God that knoweth my needs and whose good pleasure it is to give me the kingdom. I'm going to accept a God as the all and only power in this universe. I'm consciously going to do that. And as often as possible, I'm going to allow my thought to turn in that direction during the day. When I see the headlines in the paper, when I hear the radio, when my friends begin to talk, negative talk, I am inwardly going to realize that I have no God but the one God. I have no God but the God of infinite omnipresent power, a God that has no opposite, a God that has no opposition, a God that does not have to battle error because the infinite nature of God makes error a nothingness. You remember the Hebrew prophet who people were in fear because the enemy that were coming against them were twice as strong as they were. And they ran to their Hebrew master and he said, fear not. They have only the arm of flesh. We have the Lord God Almighty. And then what happened the enemy began fighting among themselves and they killed each other off and this master's followers didn't even have to go out to war. So it is, when you take your position on this one infinite God that is so close to you that you don't even have to call upon it, is within you and already knows everything that you're thinking, and when you take your stand that that is your God, the Father within you, and that because of this, you need not fear what mortal man can do to you. You need not fear what germs or time or age can do to you. You need not fear what human beliefs can do to you because you can touch the leper and prove that it isn't power. You can spit at blindness and prove that it can be healed with nothing. Why? Because it isn't a power. Then, then and then only, are you commencing to understand the God that was presented to the world by Jesus Christ. Up to that time, God was a God of good and evil. God could give you good, but God could also punish you. But remember that under the Christian dispensation, God had no power to punish you for anything none whatsoever and never did punish anyone 
There isn't a single record in the teaching of Jesus that God punished anyone for anything, not even being caught in adultery, not even for being a thief on the cross. For nothing in every case the Master recognized, neither do I condemn thee. Now remember, he said he did nothing of himself, only that which he saw the Father do. Therefore, the Father never condemned anything. You might ask the question right here, is there no punishment for sin? Indeed, there is. Terrible punishment. But God has nothing to do with it. The sin itself carries within itself the seed of punishment. It is just like writing down two times two is five. Does God do that? Does God punish you because you say two times two is five? No. Well, you may go broke giving out uh, five for four, but no use blaming God. It was your ignorance that two times two are four. In the same way, God will never punish anyone for anything. There's no provision in the teaching of Jesus Christ for punishment by God. But the punishment is in the act. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. And Paul says, if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. If you re uh, sow to the Spirit, you will reap life everlasting. Neither one of them say a word about God in that. It's all you, ye. You, what you do has within it the seed of the return. The moment you have the giving nature, that givingness returns unto you. Not always from the same direction in which you've given, but it doesn't have to. Jesus was certainly not rewarded by the people that he blessed. But let us not doubt that he was rewarded. Now, when you begin to perceive that the errors of this world are not as black as they're painted, they're not as dangerous. They're not as harmful. You will learn how spiritual healing is brought about. Spiritual healing is not the use of a God power over an evil power. Heavens, no. If such a thing were true, God would be a horrible mess. Because that would mean that some people could use the power of God for healing and others couldn't. God can't be that way. The first thing you learn when you have a God experience is that God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't know the difference between a Jew and a Gentile, a white or a black. God knows no difference. God knows nothing about religions. As a matter of fact, the closer you get to God, the less of religions there are. Why? Who needs anything when they have God's government? Who needs anything other then the realization, thy grace is my sufficiency. Is there any indication in that, that you first have to go off somewhere? Why, the Master said, no more shall ye worship in this holy mountain, nor yet in Jerusalem. That was as much blasphemy in that day as if you were to say today that you shouldn't worship in church. Well, I can tell you that there have been a lot of people in these last two wars who found out that God was very close to them without any churches around the corner. They had to find God right where they were, in a rubber boat in the ocean, or an airplane up in the air, or in a submarine down the bottom. And they didn't have time to run around looking for churches either. If God wasn't present where they were, then they were hopeless. No longer shall you pray in this holy mountain or yet in Jerusalem. That doesn't mean <laughs> that we should cut out churches. Oh, no. They're a fine place to worship in. But it means that there's no need specifically to be in a church to pray because the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now, I say these things to you, but you can't remember them. That's an impossibility. I can say more in 60 minutes than you can remember in 60 weeks. But if, along with the hearing, 
if you are reading these things in the books until they take root in you, until they become flesh of your flesh and blood of your blood and bone of your bone, until they really become realized within you, then you're free. Then you're free. Then you can walk up and down this world. And you don't have to think of teachers or teachings or books because you live in the consciousness of the place where I stand is holy ground. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. If I go into the valley of the shadow of death, thou art there. It makes no difference. You live constantly in God consciousness and you never allow yourself to be out of God consciousness. So you see, you have to learn about a God who is not too well known. You have to learn about prayer as it is not too well known. You have to know the meaning of meditation and uh, practice meditation, more especially the contemplative form, the form of taking a passage and pondering it and thinking about its meaning until you feel something within you say, ah, that is the truth. Surely the day comes when you are so full of these principles that every time you are faced with some form of error, whether for yourself or for patients or students or for the world, automatically God speaks to you from within yourself and pours one of these passages into your mind. That is the place when you have reached the higher form of prayer. Now, the higher form of prayer has no words or thoughts to it. Who, by taking thought, can add one stature to, his cu to one cubit to a stature? Who, by taking thought, can make a white hair black? And if you cannot, by taking thought, do these minor miracles, how do you ever think that by taking thought you're going to do something really worthwhile? And the answer is you aren't. <clears throat> so that as you learn these truths, these principles, as you practice them, you automatically get to a place where your mind is no longer filled with them, where you look out at life with an entirely different view. And then, when an ugly picture presents itself out here, something from within you gives you the truth that you need with which to meet it. It flares up into you. That is what we call receptivity. It is, for instance, when I'm called upon for help, now remember, I had 13 years of study, and then I had 16 years of practice. And so now when you ask for help, I don't have to go back in my mind and fish around for all these statements of truth. There is as much in my mind as if I'd originally written them. So I merely get quiet, and both of my ears are open, and I wait. And then all of a sudden, something comes through. It may be a passage of the Bible. It may be something from my own writings. It may be something from other writings that I've read. But it is the Word of God, and it is quick and sharp and powerful. Now, very often, when we are giving the treatment in our earlier stages, and when we are repeating these principles and truths that we learn, healings may not always be quite so quick and sharp and powerful but when we reach that stage where we are no longer a part of the work where we could truthfully say I have nothing to do with this I'm merely an instrument through which it flows transparency then we get to this place of prayer where we sit like this and wait 
And then something comes, and we call it the Word of God. Sometimes it's a specific message. Sometimes it's only a feeling. But with it comes the assurance, God is on the field, all is well, and that is that. And it is the same thing in our teaching work. When I'm going to give a talk, if I were to sit around making up something in advance to say, I'd hardly have the courage to call it the Word of God. That would more than likely be called a message from Joel. But I don't do that, as you know. My meditation in my room is this listening ear and then when I feel that deep breath or that presence I know that the evening is going to be all right and then I sit down and begin to talk and whatever is going to come out comes out and it usually turns out to be that the need of that evening has been met so it is that as you go on with the study you will find a teaching in our writings that is also based on one of the deepest secrets that the Master taught. Secrets that are so deep that although they are repeated in churches, I've never yet found a church where they could explain the meaning of it or demonstrate it. The teaching is this. The disciples say to the master who has missed his lunch, shall we go to the city and bring you some meat? And the master says, I have meat that ye know not of. The world knoweth not of. Bread? I am the bread. Wine? Truth? Resurrection? Not, I will be resurrected. I am the resurrection. I will have eternal life. Nothing like it. I am eternal life. What does the Master mean? Is that a teaching that is demonstrable? Well, you may be assured that it is. It's another one of the cornerstones of the infinite way taken right from the Master. What does it mean and how do you demonstrate it? It means that since I and the Father are one, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. If you were to take that literally, it means that there is embodied in my consciousness everything of which I shall have need from now to doomsday, from now unto the end of the world. And that I do not, have to, do not have to ask for it, I do not have to beg for it or plead for it or be worthy of it, I do not have to earn my living by the sweat of my brow. I already have bread. I already have meat and wine. I already am life eternal. Egotistically, no, not by virtue of myself, but by virtue of my oneness with God. Of myself I'm nothing, but my oneness with God makes me heir to all that God has. Therefore, I can claim that all that the Father hath is mine. Well, we're going to rest for a few minutes and uh, then we'll take it up and expound on that.